Welcome everyone. This is Tammy Wilson. I am the project lead for the California Dyslexia Initiative and I'm a director at the Sacramento County Office of Education. I am really excited to welcome everyone. We have uh, participants from around the state and even other states who are joining us for this learning opportunity. We are really excited with our Understanding Dyslexia webinar series. This is the third webinar in our series. And today we are featuring Dr. Nancy Cushion White from the University of California, San Francisco, who has a lot of wonderful content for us to explore. We have had the pleasure of having Dr. Cushion White uh, present at our county office several times and people have walked away with just a wealth of information and knowledge and new learning. So to support you in this uh, learning, we have a Padlet that houses the slides. So uh, my colleague will put that Padlet link in the chat. It has the slides from the previous two webinars as well as today's. And we also have a companion document. So if you're interested in exploring the content of today's webinar further, please check out the companion document because you'll find prompts and additional resources on the top topic. Um, the California next slide. Uh, the California Dys Dyslexia Initiative is a partnership. We are working very closely with the University of California San Francisco Dyslexia Center on this work, and we're also partnering with the CDE and the CCEE as well as the state board. So the goal of our initiative is to really provide professional development that supports districts and schools across our state, as well as county office colleagues and other stakeholders. So we're really excited to present this series. And in order to do so, we have partnered with Glean Education and the founder of Glean Education, Jessica Hammond, is going to facilitate this webinar. So I'm gonna hand off to her. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you, Tammy. We are really thrilled to partner with SCOE and the California Dyslexia Initiative to coordinate this webinar series. For those of you who may not know about us, Glean Education partners with schools, districts, and states to deliver online training, school leader consulting, and web-based coaching. Our work aims to build educator understanding of evidence-based literacy practices to improve student literacy outcomes. This webinar is the third in a series of webinars on dyslexia and literacy delivered by some of the nation's top experts in the field. So if you haven't registered for the future ones yet, please do, we'll be popping the registration links in the chat momentarily. Today, it's my pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Nancy Cushion White. She's a clinical professor in pediatrics and adolescent young medicine young adult medicine at UC San Francisco and a member of the UCSF Dyslexia Center team. Her career in education has included work as a general and special education teacher, a psychoeducational evaluator, a literacy interventionist, a teacher trainer, and a curriculum developer. She's a certified instructor of teaching in the Slingerland multisensory structured language approach. It's a method of structured literacy instruction. Dr. Cushion Wright White has received numerous awards for her contributions in the field, including the Honored Instructor Award from UC Berkeley Extension, the Margaret Bird Rawson Lifetime Achievement Award from the International Dyslexia Association, the Etoile Dubard Award of Excellence from the International Multisensory Structured Language Education Council, IMSLIC, and recognition of extraordinary leadership and accomplishment from the Northern California branch of the International Dyslexia Association. She currently serves on the California State Literacy Team. Please help me welcome Dr. Nancy Cushion White. Welcome, Nancy. Thank you, Jessica and Tammy. I appreciate this opportunity to speak to you about one of my favorite subjects, and I'm going to begin by telling you why it's one of my favorite subjects. I began my career as a third and fourth grade teacher. I was one of those teachers equipped to teach only those children who could learn in spite of me, not because of me. 
I had credentials in three states that should have meant I knew how to teach reading. And the worst part was that I myself believed I was capable of teaching my students to read. I could get them to attend school regularly, to show up on time, and to do everything I asked them to do. Yet what I was able to do in the realm of teaching reading was grossly inadequate. Of 37 fourth graders in my general ed classroom, one boy could read approaching grade level. About five were two years below grade expectations, and the rest of the boys could read virtually nothing, with the girls in only slightly better reading shape. I wasn't worried. After all, I had credentials in three states that indicated I could teach reading. I got right to work, tried everything I had been taught, which sadly didn't take very long, only to find out that I had no idea how to help my students, the ones who really needed me, to teach them how to read. Their compliance with every request I made only made me feel worse. So I went to my principal for help. He assured me that my students were just fine and that I had nothing to worry about. Translation, they weren't running all over the school terrorizing the other kids in classrooms as they had the year before. No help was offered, nor did he seem to think I needed any help. I cared, I really, really cared, and if nothing else, I'm stubborn, tenacious, and unwilling to give up. So for the next five years, I took every class I could find in the San Francisco Bay Area, even remotely related to reading. I learned something from every class I took. I finally lucked out. I was in a new school with a new job and a new principal who suggested that I attend a reading demo after school. Lucky me. Turned out to be a demo by Beth Slerlin with San Francisco Unified School District Middle School boys, all at least two feet taller than she was. Within seconds, she had every one of them whipped into shape and encoding words on a pocket chart. I was convinced to take the intro to the Slingerland class the following summer, a month-long intensive that included both daily classroom demo and one-to-one -one supervised practicum. Having become a bit cynical over the course of my five-year quest for effective reading instruction, albeit impressed with the daily progress I was observing in our summer school students, I kept asking questions. But this is Menlo Park, the suburbs. Will this work with my city kids in San Francisco? So many questions that I'm sure the instructors would have liked to put a sock in my mouth to shut me up. Nevertheless, I returned to my class in kids in San Francisco, tried out my new strategies, had some of the same kids I had taught previously, saw immediate progress. I only knew a tiny little bit, but even that much was making an immediate difference. So took the second year, third year classes, the following two summers, became a demo teacher, eventually a teacher training course director, haven't had a summer vacation since. But I've been using the approach in the classroom, in small groups, and in one-to-one -one settings with students from kindergarten to young adults in the pretrial diversion program through San Francisco Superior Court, and they all learn to read. So in the first two of the series of, uh, in this series of webinars, Dr. Jack Fletcher and Dr. Hugh Katz discussed the characteristics of dyslexia and the advantages of early screening and identification of all of our students who may be at risk for struggling to read and write. So you already know that dyslexia is a multidimensional spectrum condition and that there are various traits and characteristics, symptoms, that fall along a continuum so that every person with dyslexia has a unique pattern of language learning strengths and weaknesses. The good news is that the treatment is educational, so there is something we can do about it. This scenario illustrates one profile of dyslexia that occurs very frequently. This little girl, she's trying to read the word volcano. She's looking at the first letter. She doesn't seem to have any other strategies and she becomes discouraged, she gives up. Notice the change in her body language from the first to the second, she gives up. She resorts to relying on picture context and comes up with the word tornado. Her teacher wonders if it's a vocabulary problem, but as you can see from reading the definition she gave for volcano, vocabulary is not the problem. Another very um, frequent profile is dyslexia and dysgraphia together. Dysgraphia is a condition of impaired handwriting, can interfere with written spelling, with the speed of writing, or both handwriting and spelling. It may occur alone, sorry, it may occur alone with dyslexia, with an oral language problem, specific language impairment, or it may occur with both dyslexia and an oral language difficulty. Students unable to do what is expected may use a variety of innovative coping strategies. Student may refuse 
because believes he's unable to do the task or knows his best effort may result in an outcome far below his own expectations, may attempt a task but never finish because he lacks efficient strategies or necessary background information, or has generally slow processing speed, or finishes a task that does not meet the expectations of either the teacher or the student. He knows what to do and has a strategy that may lead to a successful outcome, but needs far more time than average age and grade level peers. So at the end of the time allowed, the task is unfinished despite best effort and important to note, often more effort than students who finish the task successfully within that time. Sometimes it's just a question of not having efficient strategies. A student may jump from one attempt to another when one doesn't work. It may look like inattention. It may be inattention or, it may, or inattention may be a part of it, but often it's simply the student does not know how to do the task. Similar to when I'm trying to solve a computer problem and my trial and error attempt eventually comes to a successful end and I have no idea which one worked by the time I get there. Text may be beyond the ability of the student to accurately identify the words and that will compromise comprehension. Student may have difficulty holding on to multiple parts of verbal instructions and if stressed or anxious due to past failure, fear of failure, lack of confidence, that auditory short-term short -term memory or working memory may become even more compromised. To divert attention, to mask those weaknesses, the student may choose to act out with negative behaviors to change the focus. Factors that influence prognosis. Of course, the severity or degree of the problem, innate cognitive potential, but more important than any in the list above or that will come below is that inner drive, tenacity, and grit. Background, focus on educational values of the families may have an, an effect. Duration, intensity of effective remediation, whether it's delivered with fidelity. Time at which remediation begins. All of those factors are important and need to be considered. But in addition to those, the student needs to understand his own individual pattern of learning strengths and weaknesses and be able to talk about it. So the student needs to be able to put those put it into words that he can remember because he understands them, he can use to explain to a trusted friend or even to talk about to his parents or to explain to a teacher why the fact that he's having trouble with one thing and doesn't have trouble with another and why that makes sense. And all of that helps them then to become self-advocates. But the, the younger they are when they start being, being able to talk about it, the better, the more practice, the better. Remediation and accommodation, not an either-or alternative. Remediation, of course, you all know is, to, is instruction in skills or application of skills with skill that may have been acquired earlier by age peers, but the student doesn't have them and still needs to be taught. That could be teaching higher level phony manipulation skills. Perhaps a student tested as average or not looking like there were any red flags for phonological processing when less was demanded, but as they move up, they're still having trouble with reading because perhaps they need those higher level phony manipulation skills. Teaching systematic decoding strategies for word identification. The student may have learned enough words to look average and look like the reading is okay, but when they come to words they've never seen before, they don't have a strategy for figuring them out. Accommodation is leveling the playing field providing services that ensure equal access to a student with a learning disability. Extended exam time, for example. A student may have had remediation so that he can read any word accurately and he may be comprehending at highest levels. Uh, but if he needs more time, if the rate of his reading is slow, then he's not going to be able to show what he has worked so hard to learn if he isn't given extended time. So that's leveling the playing field. Another example would be textbooks and audio format to stay current with, with the academic content vocabulary and background knowledge at his grade level. That's where we say, we're, we're saying remediation of his reading so he becomes a better reader, but also an accommodation that provides him with the ability to access content vocabulary and background knowledge so he can partic participate in class discussions and not have that to catch up to when he, gets, when he attains that reading level. 
So 90 to 95% of poor readers respond to evidence-based intervention. Well, what is that? What is well-trained teachers, first of all, who deliver comprehensive instruction with fidelity, but what's in the instruction that we want them to deliver? A combination of phoneme awareness, phonics, fluency, vocabulary, and reading comprehension taught together in a comprehensive approach, up to two hours a day. How direct instruction of language structure with ample time for practicing skills and application of skills in meaningful contexts, and all of it needs to be integrated. The areas, reading, writing, spelling, the skills, the content, phoneme awareness, phonics, fluency, and the instructional strategies. The bad news, when intervention is delayed until nine years of age, approximately 75% will continue to have difficulties learning to read throughout school. What we need to remember, that's the 75% who don't get the appropriate remediation delivered with fidelity with the duration and the intensity required. The students who do get that are not going to be having those same difficulties throughout school. Structured literacy is an umbrella term. It includes both programs and approaches, and there are certain basic principles that should be in any program that is labeled as structured literacy. There are many variations on the theme. Oral language foundation as um, the beginning of teaching any kind of literacy. Simultaneous multimodal teaching strategies. You may have wondered why we use the term multimodal in the title of this session instead of multisensory. The reason is to put emphasis on the learning, the sensory pathways or learning modalities that relate to language, visual, auditory, kinesthetic, motor, for both for speech and for handwriting. The alphabetic principle. English is an alphabetic language, and we need to point out, to make the kids aware of why that can be an, an advantage in learning how to read and spell. Integration of all of the language arts, skills, reading, spelling, handwriting, not teaching in each one in separate ways without integrating and making the children, teaching the interconnections and interrelationships. Builds from skills to functional use. Every lesson needs to teach skills, but practice those skills functionally in meaningful ways. And of course, the goal is always independence. If our students can only do what we're teaching, then when we're there standing over them, then we haven't done our jobs. Teaches through the intellect. Doesn't teach kids to memorize a whole list of rules, but teaches the logic and structure of English so that they can figure out the answers or the solutions to language problems, the interrelationships. Oral language is the foundation of literacy. Most people don't have difficulty learning to understand and speak the language that they're first exposed to. That understanding and speaking precedes reading. Reading then enriches verbalized expression, which different kinds of sentence structures and language structures and vocabulary. The three of those then proceed written expression, and together they form that complete auditory, visual, kinesthetic language function. The language cortex from birth to six. Look at the incredible degree of development from birth to six years old, the connections. What is that showing us? That learning happens when networks of dendrites grow. When new dendrites sprout from existing dendrites, learning is happening. We're adding new knowledge to what we already know, like a tree sprouting twigs from existing branches. Growing dendrites takes time and practice. Practice makes permanent. This is emphasizing the simultaneous multimodal language processing. So for example, if we're teaching a letter, the student is looking at the letter form as he or she is tracing it, naming the letter, as it's being traced at the same time that those that sequence of movements for forming the letter that they are tracing. So the three of those connected, that would be simultaneous, not looking at it and then writing it and then saying it, but doing all those at the same time. Language is an intersensory functioning. So if you look at the various tasks and you notice the parts of the brain that are most activated during those tasks and imagine if all those things are happening at the same time, then we're building those connections that we talked about. And again, reminding you that kinesthetic 
is talking about speech and handwriting. Word reading, multiple levels of analysis. We could look at a word, and if we have a long word like this, if we start with just the grapheme phoneme, which is the way students begin with shorter words, by the time they get to longer words, that's no longer efficient. Think about i, n, t, er, r, a, p, t, i, n. By the time I get to the end, I may not even remember what was happening here. So we need to learn other ways of integrating that. We can divide words into syllables. We can divide words into morphemes. Dividing words into syllables helps students to pronounce a word that they don't recognize correctly. The morphemes contribute more to the spelling and to the meaning, and of course, the whole word. So stripped of irrelevant features, and this is an important point because it makes a bigger important point. It's, it's saying that font, case, and size are irrelevant features. It does not matter what font I chose to print these words, whether I have mixed uppercase and lowercase, all uppercase, all lowercase. If some of the letters are three feet tall and some of the letters are short, it doesn't matter. You would still be able to read the word because you know the letters. The letters in a word are what make one word different from another word, which is why we have to look at all of them. So the letter string may be broken down into elementary components, which are shown there, starting with the graphemes, the single letters or digraphs, the syllables, the morphemes. Then our brain can use that information to compute sound and meaning. And the more times that it's interpreted correctly, the fewer practice times there will be for the student to then recognize it without having to consciously give attention to those pieces. But the way to get to that unconscious recognition is the practice correctly along the way. Triple word form theory. Dr. Berninger um, began talking about that a long time ago, and it's still under lot, is still discussed in the research and, and being um, found more and more compelling. Learning to read and write words is a process of increasing awareness and coordination, integration of three different types of word forms and their parts, phonology, the speech sounds or phonemes. Speech sounds, not just sounds, speech sounds. The speech sounds that we make when we talk. And there's a sequence of movements for each one of those speech sounds. Orthography, the graphemes that spell those phonemes. Orthography also includes morphemes, the meaningful units. Those morphemes and meaningful units are spelled with the same graphemes and represent the same 44 plus or minus phonemes or speech sounds that are in all of the other parts. So it's the same graphemes and the same phonemes. Morphemes change their pronunciation depending upon what word they're in, where the stress is and how many syllables are in that word. But if the students are aware of the interconnections between all three of these systems, that's something that they can work with. Pattern recognition. Most of us read, we think, we may think that we're recognizing words as wholes because we've acquired such um, a deep, richly interconnected and ready knowledge of how they're spelled, how they're pronounced, and what their meanings are. Skillful readers, believe it or not, automatically and quite thoroughly process the component letters seen in text. It may be unconscious if it's automatic, but it's happening. Because their visual knowledge of words, is from memories of the sequences of letters or patterns of which the words are comprised. So it's those same sequences, those same orthographic patterns that occur in every word in English that we read. That's orthographic memory, not visual memory. We don't memorize every single word. What we've learned and committed to memory are the sequences of letters that occur in every word. So orthographic memory not visual memory. This is a sample for illustration. It's of a basic daily lesson plan format that integrates all of the aspects of structured literacy instruction. It happens to be the Slingerland approach that's for this lesson plan, different structured literacy approaches and programs will use different lesson plan formats and they may organize in them differently. What I'm trying to get across is several things. One is that all the components are included in a comprehensive way and 
uh, the skills to functional use. So the Slingerland approach teaches uh, kids to write any letters before we ask them to, to use them in spelling. Then in the skills section of the goal is always going to be independent written expression, but the skills part of each lesson will be phoneme graphing practice. That's less than a word, encoding at the word level, practicing spelling words, and then the functional use is using the spelling, adding suffixes and prefixes to the words, using them in phrases, sentences, and larger concept uh, of written expression. And dictation, again, leading toward independent writing. But skills, functional use. You may be teaching new skills, but you're always reviewing past skills and using them more functionally. On the reading side, graphing to phoneme, below the word level, decoding at the word level, skills, then using those in preparing the students to read connected text, pre-teaching pre vocabulary, teaching the syntax and grammar that they need to chunk words into meaningful phrases, and then reading connected text. And the goal, always independence. We can never teach them all they need to know, but we can teach them to think. I see this, I get this look a lot. So teaching to the intellect, scaffolding responses, eliciting responses, and the question he's asking, why do you always ask me a question when I ask you a question? Well, the reason is because if I just answer his question, I don't know how much he's thinking about the answer. I also don't know if I've actually answered the specific question he asked. So the first thing I want to know is what does he already know about that question? So I need to ask questions to get back to that point where I'm sure of what he knows. It also makes him sure of what he knows. And he probably knows more than he thought he did when he asked the question. And then we can move forward. And I'd like to say a lot more about that, but I can't right now. Okay. So structured literacy. Remember, structured literacy is an umbrella term and any structured literacy approach or program should include certain um, content in the instruction, the, the what is taught. That instructional format should be integrated, so the teaching of handwriting, reading, spelling, written expression should be taught in an integrated way relating all of those skills. Phonology, phonics, morphology and etymology, syntax and grammar, and semantics. I'm going to talk about each one very briefly. Phonological processing, most of you are familiar with the CTOP, Comprehensive Test of Phonological Processing, both with the one and the two. In the manual, the CTOP manual talks about the three categories under phonological processing. Phonological awareness is the one that leads to phonemic awareness, which is most specifically related to word identification and spelling. Blending, segmentation, and manipulation need to be understood at a rudimentary basic level in order for phonics to make sense. Because it, without a, an understanding and awareness of how to blend sounds together to pronounce a syllable or a word, how to segment syllables, and how to manipulate them at the very most basic level, there is no understanding of place value, in which case the sequence of sounds or letters in words would not be something that students understand. So once they have that basic rudimentary understanding and remembering that blending specifically leads to decoding, is a part of decoding and word ID, segmentation a part of encoding and spelling, and phoneme manipulation a part of both. And Dr. Kilpatrick has made us very aware of the need for higher level phoneme manipulation skills, which explains why some students who may have seemed like they didn't have a reading problem but only a spelling problem may have actually memorized enough words to look like they didn't have a reading problem. And if they don't have this phony manipulation at those higher level skills, then we need to teach it. Kinesthetic awareness for speech and handwriting. There is a unique sequence of movements for pr pronunciation of each phoneme, which makes it different from every other phoneme. Likewise, there's a unique sequence of movements for formation of each letter of the alphabet, whether it's being formed in manuscript or cursive. Pencil grip. Why does it matter? Well, it reduces fatigue and strain on the hand, encourages fluent rather than jerky writing, and paves the road to automaticity.
research findings on handwriting, a summary. What some of you are thinking right now is I want her to tell me which is better to teach cursive or manuscript first. And the answer is it depends, which is not the answer you wanted, but that is the answer because individual differences predict who will do best with manuscript cursive or keyboarding, and it has to do with ages and stages. Dr. Berninger suggests that all children should taught, be taught to be multilingual by hand, which means they would learn manuscript cursive and handwriting and keyboarding. First graders with low handwriting skill improved whether taught cursive or printing as long as they were taught in a very comprehensive integrated way and they were taught write to form the letters in cursive or manuscript in the context of using those letters to spell and write words. Summary of findings for manuscript. Children encounter more written materials in manuscript fonts than cursive fonts, whether reading books or screens. So printing manuscript letters transfers to the kinds of letters seen in books and on screens more consistently than to cursive. Despite small variations in letter forms sharing the same name, like G or A, these advantages include learning to recognize and write letters. So brain imaging studies have shown that during early childhood, writing manuscript letters improves letter recognition and the other way around. A summary of findings for cursive increases the speed of handwriting. You don't have to pick up your pencil after each, after writing each letter. Oh, when you're writing cursive, reduces reversals. I, when I'm facing my student, I'm writing backwards so that what they see that I'm writing is, is, um, is correct. And you can practice it after the session. Try writing your name in cursive. It's really hard to go in the wrong way once you start. It's not so hard to go in the wrong way if you're doing manuscripts. So it does reduce reversals. Consistency in where to begin the formation of each lowercase cursive letter. If students are taught, to begin every single cursive letter with its co um, connecting stroke, it's always there. They never have to stop and decide before they make a letter, do I put the connecting stroke or not? That is eliminating one decision that they will never have to make again once you learn it that way. Continuous strokes sometimes link letters into lexical units which can improve spelling. And as Dr. Berninger says, cursive helps you connect things. This is not just for cursive, this is for manuscript and keyboarding or just about anything else. Automaticity comes only with sufficient practice. Students may learn to write cursive. If they don't use it, they're not going to get to that point of automaticity. Rationale for use of letter names. Some structured literacy programs and approaches name the letters as they're writing them. Some of them give uh, speech sounds. I'm giving you the rationale for use of letter names. I'm not saying one is right and one is wrong. They're, they're rationales for using either and they're good ones. I'm giving the rationale for use of letter names. The name doesn't change. The name of the letter is stable. The shape of the letter may change. Upper lowercase, cursive or manuscript, vary, a variety of fonts. The speech sound represented by a letter may vary. Vowels can have a long sound, a short sound, or an alternate to that. There may be alternate speech sounds for C and G and a couple of other consonants. The goal of handwriting instruction is automatic functional use. Speed develops as the movements for writing by hand and keyboarding become automatic. We teach our students to have, to find, we help them discover what we call their ideal or optimum speed. What does that mean? It means as fast as you can, but as slowly as you must. If, and there can be ideal speed for other things besides handwriting, but we're gonna just talk about handwriting for right now. As fast as you can means fast enough that, that you feel the sequence of movements for making that letter so that you can feel what's unique about forming that letter from forming any of the others but slowly enough that you're still in charge of your pencil and that your pencil isn't running away with things. The goal, remember, is to provide an automatic legible tool that enhance, enhances all aspects of language. Formation of each individual letter consists of a unique sequence of movements that defines it, makes it different from every other letter form. 
And I think some of you are probably thinking, well, wait a minute. There are lots of different ways to make letters. There are. There are many correct ways to form every single letter in manuscript and even more so in cursive. However, if you don't choose one way and insist that the students use one way, no way will become automatic. So you need to make that decision and they need to stick to it. Learning one way to form each individual letter and forming the letter the same way every time it's written supports progress toward automatic letter formation, the goal of learning to write by hand. If that doesn't happen, then every time they get ready to write a letter, they're going to have to decide which way they're going to use. That is not work, that's not working toward functional use and um, automaticity. Handwriting is not functional until it's automatic. Keyboarding is not fully functional until it's possible to type without looking at the keys. Speed is not the road to success. Careful practice is the road to speed. And yes, I do have a t-shirt with those words on it. This is Michael. He's in the fourth grade, nine and a half. He actually was identified as an intellectually gifted student with his cognitive full scale. A standard score of had to be 130 in order for that to happen. You see his standard score for reading is an 83 and his standard score for spelling is a 62. He could not finish the marks. He couldn't even correctly form some of them. Um, this is something fourth graders usually look forward to because it's so manageable. He has um, BD confusions that you see. You see some two words that begin with CK, which brings a question up about his orthographic memory since no word in English begins with CK. Most important for his prognosis is that he didn't give up. This was the last word that I dictated. The whole group was at their ceiling level by the time we got here. But if he, he was, the instructions were to write what you can spell. If you can't spell the whole word, but you can spell part of it, write the part you can spell. If you can't spell any of it, write a line so you don't lose your, lose your place. He gave it his best effort to the bitter end. This was five months later. He still didn't finish the marks. Better quality, but we didn't teach the marks. We did teach him to write in cursive. He has a long way to go. But these words have syllables. Each syllable has um, a grapheme to represent a vowel sound. You can even tell what most of the words are, which you couldn't on the other page. And his standard score, remember over here, was a 62 with a percentile of 1. And he's gone to a standard score of 88 with a percentile of 21, way far below his ability level, but way far above where he was when we started. So. This is a student who is just a, it's in the summer between ninth and 10th grade. You can see from looking at this, this is just a part of his, um, the word level. He also had phrases and sentences to write, but I'm just showing you the words. You can see that the focus of this summer school was going to be, in addition to handwriting, was gonna be on uh, phonological properties and, and morphology, and it was. And it was 18 days because we had to give up two days for holiday and three and a half hours of hard labor later for those 18 days this is what he was able to write now he, he's come a long way he's still confused between the CISE which means to cut and the SCI which means to know as in science or um, conscious but he certainly has learned a lot and he sorted out a lot that he didn't know before Perils of over-reliance on whole word guessing. If you look at what the student said, or the way that's the error, the way the word was pronounced, and what was in print, you see that there's a huge difference in terms of context and, and meaning. Most of the words do begin close to the um, same way, both the error and the uh, correct, but and some of them end the same way. But the point is, he, this student, well, it's not one student, thank goodness, these students had not learned to systematically decode or identify words. And here we have my friend again. He has a different question this time. He says, my guessing way of reading unfamiliar words has been working just fine. And you want me to do what? Well, this is why I want him to do what. And the what is that I want to teach him systematic strategies for decoding every word he comes to so that he knows how to figure out a word, whether he's ever seen it.
before or not and can figure out what it is. And he may be one of those students who was uh, described as not having a reading problem but only a spelling problem. But if you look at the errors that those students do make, even though their score may be average or above average for word reading, look at the errors. What was the error? What did he do? How did he try to pronounce a word that um, he didn't recognize? Probably similar to this. And he, needed, he needs to know. So when he comes to those content words in academic text, he'll be able to read them. How skillful readers read. Skillful readers visually process virtually every individual letter of every word because that's what makes one word different from every other one. And it doesn't matter whether it's isolated words or in meaningful connected text. To pause or not to pause, no longer a question. Encourage students to pause and study a word they don't know. If they guess and it's wrong, then they have practiced an error. If they pause, take the time to use strategies that they've learned, and they correctly pronounce the word, it takes longer than if they guessed, and it takes even longer than if they skipped it. But then they've had practice with doing it correctly, and the next time it might take just a little bit less time than the time before, and they're on their way in a positive direction. Morphology, accommodations. I, this word is misspelled quite often. Some, I guess the question would often be, are there two C's or two M's? Well, let's look at it. This is the prefix AD, which, was assimil which means uh, to or toward, assimilated to AC because it's gonna be attached to another prefix that begins with a C. That prefix is CON, which is assimilated to COM, because it's going to be attached to a base that begins with M. So we didn't double. We have a C at the end of this prefix at the beginning of this one, and M at the end of this prefix and the beginning of this base. Then we have, we're going to add A-T-E. This suffix begins with a vowel, so we have to replace this final single silent E. Same thing happens to this E because of this suffix. This makes it into a verb, this one makes it into an idea noun, and then we have the inflectional suffix s, which makes it plural. So if you've been dying to know what that base means, you probably already knew. Manner or measure, or, or say a type, or a way. So these are derivational suffixes because they change the part of speech, and this inflectional suffix doesn't change the part of speech, it's still a noun. It's a, it's a noun without it, it's a, it's a singular noun, and the S makes it a plural noun. How accurately can words be identified by context alone? Poor readers over rely on context. The content words that carry meanings are predictable only 10% of the time. Content words are nouns, verbs, adjectives, and most adverbs. Those are the words in, that have lots and lots and lots of synonyms, especially in English. So none of them will be used as often in English because there's so many choices. So for that reason, they may be less familiar and they may not have been learned words. They need to be decoded accurately to be identified. There's a higher level of predictability with function words, conjunctions, prepositions, articles, uh, helping verbs. And contain, they contain fewer letters and there are very few synonyms, so they're going to be a lot more high frequency. But they also appear in every, you can't have a sentence without function words. Knowledge, the ability to apply knowledge of letter sound correspondences to identify words is fundamental to independent word recognition. Good readers rely on the letters in the word, not the context or pictures. And I hate to keep repeating myself, but because it's the letters in the word that make one word different from another. No comprehension strategy is powerful enough to compensate for inability to read the words. And some of you don't necessarily agree with me that context is not a good way to identify words, and I don't have time to really do this well, but I'm gonna give you about 90 seconds to read as much of this as you can and figure out those words that are not completely there. You can guess those words with blanks with context. If I could see you, I would see some of you having your brows begin to wrinkle, but I can't see you, so I don't know whether that's happening.
Now, I know that wasn't enough time to get a full experience, but if there is a way, um, even in the chat, to write whether that was easy for you, whether it was harder or easier than you anticipated, any feelings or thoughts you have about that exercise as it relates to guessing unknown words by context, then we will appreciate that feedback. And I apologize for stopping you and not letting you finish, although some of you might be glad I didn't make you finish. Okay, text reading fluency. I really want to talk about fluency as much more than words correct per minute. It may surprise you to know that reading fluency wasn't such a thing before the National Reading Panel Report in 2000. I'm not saying we didn't talk about reading with expression, reading um, fluidly, not reading word by word, all of those things we talked about, but it wasn't, it, it didn't, it wasn't termed as reading fluency in the same way. It became a thing for a good reason, because in that reading panel report, the connection between fluency and reading comprehension was noted. But reading fluency is much more than rate. It's a combination of accuracy, automaticity, and oral reading prosody. Automaticity subsumes the rate piece, but accuracy is also in there. Taken together, all of those components support a reader's comprehension. Appropriate pacing is central to fluency, but we, as skilled readers, vary our reading pace depending upon why we're reading, what we're reading, how difficult it is for us, how complex the ideas are. So it's important to learn to be flexible, not just fast. Fluency is about being able to mobilize as much knowledge as possible about a word fast enough to have time to think and comprehend. The role of fluency gives the executive system enough time to direct, it, to direct attention where it's most needed. Prerequisites for text reading fluency. Coordination, connecting, integration of all the systems of language structure, phonology, orthography, syntax and grammar, semantics. The goal is automatic retrieval of information from each of those systems. How? Through understanding and practice. Understanding. Understanding how to chunk words into meaningful phrases within a sentence and practice doing that to allow focus on comprehension. And it doesn't matter what type of text in that case. Learning how to read by phrase units or idea units significantly increases students' understanding of what they read. The ability to recognize meaningful chunks of text helps develop fluency and comprehension. Though most readers chunk automatically, chunking strategies must be taught to struggling readers. Students who read complex text with prosody, meaning in syntactically correct, meaningful phrases, comprehend what they read. Dr. Well, how is just about five more minutes. Okay, thank you. Simultaneous, multisensory, direct, explicit, systematic, cumulative, structured, and sequential. I'm going to talk about each one of these briefly. So direct and explicit, direct teaching of all concepts with continuous student-teacher interaction, never assuming learning, always the concept skills and procedures are deliberately taught, gradual release of responsibility. Our goal is always that the student can, can do the work independently, but they can only do it when we're standing over them, we haven't done our job. But very important piece, teacher models, verbalizes each step and then guides the student to demonstrate and use his or her own words to verbalize those steps. If the student can explain it and has the words to do that, they can do it when we're not there and get to that independent functional use. Systematic, logical order of language, start with the simple concepts, uh, progress to the complex, cumulative, new and less familiar concepts, previously uh, relate to whatever has come before using the same precise and consistent language, whether it's simple or not. Don't change the vocabulary as you move along. It's confusing to them. Anticipate how you're going to need to use that vocabulary in future learning. 
classroom groups, small groups, one-to-one, -one, diagnostic teaching, always individualizing based upon careful and continuous assessment, informal assessment, observation throughout every single lesson, every single day. That helps you plan the next day's lesson. But you also need to have formal standardized assessment tools so you can get an objective picture of whether or not the gap is really narrowing for the students. You may see progress, but you need to be able to look at it in that way. But you need to do that less often, but you need to do it enough to be sure that they're moving. Teachers monitor student performance throughout every lesson to identify any concepts or skills that need clarification. The goal, mastery of skills and content. What makes learning stick? Practice makes permanent. So we need to be certain that what we practice, they practice, all of us practice, is what we want to become permanent. Drill leads to skill, which does lead to thrill. A couple of big ideas to ponder. Lower level language mastery is as essential for the literacy teacher as anatomy is for the physician. It is our obligation to enable teachers to acquire it. Reading and spelling are different sides of the same coin. The reading network includes connections between functional areas specific to phonological, orthographic, and morphological information within our brains. So in instruction that integrates the teaching of reading, spelling, handwriting, and written expression through one comprehensive approach is likely to be more effective than teaching each of those aspects of written language separately. FIDE is a Latin base that means to trust. Fidelity plus intensity plus duration leads to efficiency, excellence, efficacy, a recipe worthy of our trust. So a parting thought, know your stuff, know whom you're stuffing, and stuff every minute of every lesson. Thank you. Excellent. Excellent, Dr. Christian White. Thank you so much for sharing that with us and leaving us on that wonderful note. Uh, I know many people are going to be much more informed about structured literacy after hearing this. We do have some time for a few questions, which I'll be asking in a moment. But before I do, I wanted to mention the companion document that we have created to accompany each webinar. The webinar companion document includes prompts to discuss after attending the webinar and additional resources to further explore the webinar content with your professional learning cohort. The webinar companion documents and recordings can be found at scoey.net slash CA dyslexia. So if you would forward to the next slide, Dr. Cushion White, we have our survey link and Wynn will pop this in the chat as well. And while we are asking questions for the remainder of our time with Dr. Christian White, please do hop on that link and fill out the survey so we know where we stand and how we can continue to serve you well. So Dr. Christian White, we got a few great questions in the uh, Q&A. And one of the first ones I'd like to pose to you is, is there any evidence that this approach is only effective for students with dyslexia? The reason I ask the person who asked the question poses is because I'm wondering why more districts are not adopting this phonics-based reading program. It seems so effective. Well, first of all, as a, as a tier one approach, um, certainly all of our students could benefit from knowing more about language structure. Those of us who were teachers who had to learn the hard way and the long way the way I did, would have I would have been delighted if, if somebody had pointed out to me along the way that, that this was available. But I have to tell you a story, a real life story. There was a student in one of our summer month long summer school classes. He was only there because his handwriting was not readable. And his teacher, his second grade teacher said, we got to get this taken care of. So this is going to keep haunting you forever. He could spell and he could read. but And so I tried really hard to make sure that when I was introducing the lower level concepts that I was making it clear to him why it mattered and how it fit into the big picture. And the last day, we, we always have a, a question of the day. The question of the day was, what have you learned in summer school that'll help you the most when you return to your class in September? And he says, well, 
Well, help me the most is handwriting. That's why I'm here. But don't you want to know what I like the most? I said, of course. And he said, I think it's really neat knowing why those words I could read are pronounced that way and why the words I can spell are spelled that way. So that was really cool. So there, <laughs> it doesn't have to be a bad thing. <laughs> and so how can school districts, teachers who see that this is an important thing for their students, how can they get their school districts to see this as a priority? Any suggestions there? I wish I had the answer to that. I'd have a, not such a flat forehead if I had figured the answer to that one out <laughs> from brick, kind of knocking it against brick walls. I don't know how to do that except to perhaps point to some of the research studies that show the, the one that's in the reference section at the end of the of the presentation. I think it's near the end. It's it it it's Wolf and it was the one that had that quote where it, the next to the last slide. And um, well, Wolf and Berninger and and I forgot the other the third person, but it talked about, and this was in regular classrooms that that study was done. It wasn't done in special ed classrooms or in classrooms of students that were identified as having any disability. But even the whole premise of RTI is based upon a found foundational instruction at the beginning that teaches all of those things. And if that's what happens in kindergarten and first grade, fewer kids are going to be moving forward with the same, certainly the same degree of problems. I'm not saying it's going to get rid of students who have dyslexia, but it's going to put them in a lot better shape. And that's the whole, that was the whole point of RTI. Mm -hmm. Or is, no, I shouldn't say past, that is. But I didn't answer the question of how to do it. I wish I knew. Tammy? I think the data is often very powerful too. When you see students making progress through this approach, that's one very powerful way to show districts that it's working. But it is teacher training. Any any program or or um, approach that's being used is only going to be as strong or as effective as the knowledge, um, as the uh, language structure knowledge of the teacher using it, because that's what makes us able to know what to emphasize and what not, and how to analyze an error that a student makes. Two students may make what seems like the same error, but when in fact, when you take it apart, it isn't the same because they've made it for different reasons. And we need to understand how the language works in order to figure that out. And in order to be diagnostic in our teaching. So one final question is about explicit handwriting instruction. For teachers who recognize the importance of cursive or even explicit print instruction, what are some resources you would suggest for teachers to get started to implement this in their classroom if they don't have programs or curricula that support it currently? Okay, well, there are a number of, of approaches to teaching handwriting that, that are out there. One of the things that I can suggest that's not it's not part of the Slingerland approach, but because this, there's so much emphasis on handwriting in that approach, they have a handwriting piece that's completely separate. So one for manuscript and one for cursive. And it teaches the letter forms, it teaches the connections for cursive, and it teaches, it's not teaching all of the other pieces. It's not a structured literacy approach because it's just teaching handwriting, but that's, I think, what the question is asking is what's available that you can do that separate from. But having said that, incorporating that teaching of the handwriting, whether it's cursive or manuscript, into the reading and spelling instruction is really important. So many times I've seen teachers get really excited and teach all of the letters, and then, then they start asking the kids to use it. Well, you, that's too much. You need to teach a few letters, be able to write words with those few letters, read words with those letters. So it, it would take some integrating, but it's not impossible. Well, that's all we have time for today. And I really want to thank you for joining us, Dr. Cushion White, for this wonderful webinar. And um, thank the Sacramento County Office of Education and the California Dyslexia Initiative for co-hosting this series. Well, I thank all of you for inviting me, for putting up with me while we were putting it together. And thank you, I hope I'll be seeing you again. <laughs>